Mary Lyons, and I am The Wealth Woman. And I'm Eric Alexander from Benchmark Income Group. And this is The Big Wealth Podcast. Everything you've ever been taught about money is wrong. But don't worry, we're here to help. On this podcast, we'll use the same tools you already know to actually help set you free. Free to do what you want with your time, with your money, and with your energy. Free to live your life the way you have dreamt about. So we're going to talk about wealth knowledge, personal reflections, and the financial industry news of the day. Welcome to the Big Wealth Podcast. So today we are going to be talking about uh, how to solve the distribution problem. So Eric, if you don't mind kind of teeing us up, will you summarize what the distribution problem is? Sure, sure, sure. So if, if you're just joining us or are new to the podcast, one of the things we talked about a couple of shows ago was this. Eric, idea- Eric, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you. We're new to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Uh, but for those of you that are super new, so a couple of episodes, we talked about this idea that if I've got a million dollars and I want to have income coming out for the rest of my life, whether that's the next five years or the next 40 years, then the safe withdrawal rate, the industry standard is really centering in on this idea that the safe withdrawal rate is about 3%. So every million dollars I get in assets, I get to spend about 30, which we we talked about it in in great gory detail that none of that is exciting, right? I've got a million dollars, I killed it. Congratulations, here's 30, right? Uh, And last, the last show, we talked about some of the ideas on how to go change that mindset a little bit, change that outcome so that you're shooting for six, seven, eight percent instead of that that measly little three percent. And so today is really that kind of the culmination of some other ways to go sort of manage that environment so that you're getting more more distribution, more income without having to dramatically change how much you save and invest. Right. So I'm going to start us off with a little bit of a, a history lesson here. Um, We're going to go back a couple of generations where if you were even, you know, relatively affluent, you worked at the same job for 30 years. And at the end, uh, when you were ready to retire, you got that gold watch and then you got a pension. Right. And then on top of that, you knew you could count on Social Security and then you had your investment. So if you think about that, like a three legged stool, um, that's pretty nice. And so when we look at the world today and we look at Social Security we, uh, you know, it depends on who I talk to. If I, I like to ask people what they think is going to happen with social security, just to, to gather the opinions. And I find there seems to be kind of an age break for people who are above 50. They believe they're going to get it. And people who are below 50 right. they frequently believe they're not going to get it. Um, but regardless of that, that's, that's not the topic for today. What we want to talk about a little bit is this idea of a pension. Um, because I think when you, when you really delve into what was great about a pension is that it almost felt like magic money, especially if the pension was reinsured, then you knew there was no risk of there ever being a time where the pension wasn't going to pay you. And so when you retired, there was just a check that showed up in your mailbox every single month. And you knew that that was going to keep coming to you for the rest of your lifetime, no matter how long you lived. And when you think about what happens today, for most people that really doesn't exist. And for those that still do have pensions, what I find is very rarely is that pension big enough to make up their entire lifestyle, right? It may augment it, but it isn't gonna be big enough to to create everything that they're used to having, right? And so when when you start looking at this idea of the pension though, there's a piece of me that, that starts looking at it going, well, how, how can we still create some of these benefits or that same predictability for our clients so that especially if they don't like the market or if the market scares them, or even if they just happen to know that maybe they aren't the most disciplined. So we can sit here all day long and say right. that the magic number is a 3% withdrawal rate. But, you know, sometimes human nature is, well, but I have this giant pool of money right here. So, you know, just this, just this once, I'm going to take this extra vacation. And then right. just this once becomes over and over again, and you aren't sticking to the 3% withdrawal rate. So a discipline uh, is also an issue. There are some other strategies that can help with that so that there's more regulation almost in the way that you're spending. So we're gonna right. talk a little bit about this idea of um, how do you create something that looks and feels and smells like a pension, even though it's not actually a pension. So before right. we get into that, Eric, will you give us just a, a brief overview of how pensions work? Sure. 
Well, the, the beauty of a pension is that it's sort of like car insurance, right? If, if I- <laughs> That doesn't if, sound beautiful at all. <laughs> <laughs> actuar it's actuarially beautiful. So the beauty of a pension is like car insurance, right? So I, I don't, you know, State Farm Progressive, whoever your, cover, whoever your provider is, right? You don't give them all the money that it would take to, to cover you in the, in the state of an accident, right? You give them a little bit of money and then you and four many of your closest friends are all giving them gobs of cash. Little, bit little bits of cash, but as, as a whole, right? And what the company is doing is that they're betting that not everyone is going to have an accident all at one time. And so certain portions of the population are going to have it. And if I gave my, them my money and I didn't get to an accident, but somebody else did, then my money goes to them. So in a pension, the same kind of thing works. They say, look, we're going to put all of our money, we're going to pull it into this one giant pool of assets. And we know that some people in the pool have been shooting heroin into their eyeballs since they were five years old and they may not make it to a hundred years old, right? But then you have Jack LaLanne who's been pulling tugboats with his teeth in the ocean, right? Since he was five, he may make it to a hundred, right? So, but there's a big population. And the beautiful thing is, is, you know, Keith Richards doesn't make it to hundred, but Jack LaLanne does. And everyone else is sort of in the middle somewhere in that we can spread their risk. And because we can spread risk, we can give a lot more out in income than if we're just having to bank on one life. Because if we're doing one life, we've got to plan for life potential, which means I don't know how long you're going to live. We've got to bet that you're going to live to 120. But if I have got a big pool, then I can bet that everybody's going to die at whatever the number is, 80, 85, knowing that I can be right and wrong a lot. And the annuity company, the pension company is, is basically still in business. So I'm going to say that in a slightly different way. Um, but I'm, I'm basically just going to say the same thing that you just said. So right. you minus know, the Keith way, Richards joke, right? <laughs> yeah, that was intense. That was <laughs> intense. So, um, so if you think about this and I'm going to way oversimplify this, all right, we're going to use Bill and Bob, and, um, we're going to say for this example, that life expectancy is 80, just because it makes my math there. Now don't, don't quote me on that because I don't believe that's what life expectancy actually is. Um, it's actually a rolling target, and we can talk about that in a different episode. Um, but when you think about it, if Bill and Bob decide they're going to go into this pension together, and they each put their money into this pension plan, if life expectancy is 80, and Bill lives to be 70, and then he graduates from the planet, the money that was not paid to him till age 80 continues to be invested and grow. Right. And then when Bob hits 80, and he has spent all of his money, that money that was in there from Bill, right, is going to fund him for the duration of his life until he reaches age 90. So between the two of them, we hit life expectancy at age 80, but they both had very different experiences. And so when you start to think about why a pension works, if you look at what happens in Monte Carlo simulations, which we talked about in an earlier episode, right. um, in a Monte Carlo simulation, when you start looking at the curves, the longer the time you live, the more conservative you have to be with your withdrawal rate. And the reason for that is that the longer the time period, the higher likelihood that you will hit an adverse sequence of returns or some bad market years, right? right. And so when you think about half what happens when you pool the assets is we're actually shortening the period of time that we are looking through distribution because we're offsetting the people that have longer lifespans with the people who have shorter lifespans. So, you know, typically what we're going to say is pensions are great for people who have longevity and for people who don't have a history of longevity in their family, this may or may not be the direction right. that they choose to go. Right. But, right. but having an understanding of how they actually work, I think becomes incredibly important. So let's talk about what tools right. are available to simulate this. So I'm going to use a word for the second podcast in a row that's going to make a bunch of people cringe. Last time we talked about life insurance for a little bit. Now we're going to talk about annuities, right? So <laughs> when, um, when you think about, and I'm just going to throw this out there, Eric, I mean, you, you have a really good analogy for this, right? There are a lot of annuities on the market and a lot of them right. are not contracts that we would ever consider using ourselves or um, right. talking about with a client. So can, can you give me your car analogy here? <laughs> right, right. I, I always look at the word annuity like a Smurf word. It means a lot of different things depending on how you use it. Yeah. Right? And it's like coming in and saying, I hate cars. Cars are dumb. I'm like, well, if you're talking a Yugo, maybe. If you were talking Bugattis, maybe not. Like just because maybe you not. say 
car doesn't necessarily give you enough de enough determination to figure out whether it's a good car or not, right? Right. And so I think it's important to understand that um, we're going to talk high level concept here. But when it comes down to it, the actual contracts that you're looking at here make a huge difference in um, the safety of your assets and the performance that you're going to see over time. So just keep in mind that this is uh, by no means an exhaustive explanation of how annuities work. Um, but I do think it's important. So you know, one way that you can simulate this pension, right, is that you can um, you can leave all your money invested in the stock market and you can save everything into the stock market over the duration of your saving years. And then on the day that you're ready to retire, you can take that money and you can roll it over into what's called a joint annuity. So if you're married, right. what that's basically saying is that this money is going to pay you something that feels like a pension. You're going to get a paycheck every single month or every, you know, however you structure right. it every single month until the second one of you graduates from the planet. So, you know, if the situation is husband and wife are going along, going along, and one passes away, the income keeps going. And then when the second one passes away, that's when the income actually stops. And so when you do that and you look at payouts for annuities that are structured like that, typically the payout is going to be higher than 3%. So right. um, depending on the interest rate environment that could look and, and the age of the person who is getting into the annuity, there should be, it, it's not worth doing unless that payout rate is higher than that safe 3% withdrawal rate. So let's talk about pros and cons for this for a minute. Right. So I think that one of the biggest cons is that if we're talking about it in terms of maximizing income, if you take all of your money and you stick it into an annuity, you have no real liquidity at this point. Um, and so right. that's not great. The second thing is that if you do that, there's a high likelihood that you're going to spend through all of the money that you have deposited into this annuity, which means that there is no legacy for you to leave behind. Um, and then it also puts you into a position if you're pursuing this strategy where you are completely dependent on the interest rate environment. And so when we right. look kind of historically at payout rates and annuities, I think the, the highest payout rates we've ever seen have been just a little north of 10%. Um, right. And then when you look at an environment more like today, that may look closer to 4%, depending on age and, and other factors as well. And right. so when you look at that, putting all of your eggs into that one basket of I'm hoping I'm getting a bunch of growth and then I'm just going to pivot completely and hope to get distribution, I think can be very dangerous because we have no control over what the interest rate environment is going to look like, um, however many years into the future. And then I also think what's really important here is understanding that the market sequence that you get leading up to retirement has a tremendous impact in a strategy like this on how much you get to spend. Because what happens if you go through a 2008 type of scenario within a few years of your retirement date, right? right? Then even if you have a higher interest rate, there was no buffering factor. And I think part of our job as advisors is to plan for the worst and hope for the best. And so I'm never really comfortable in a situation where we put all our eggs into to one basket like that. So the pros right. of a solution like that are that potentially you could take a much higher payout rate than 3%. And that it's once you do that, yeah, it's, it's there for the rest of your lifetime. So right. there's not much that you have to worry about. But I think there's definitely some downsides there. What's an alternate way that we could look at that? Yeah, and I'm going to say the evil word that we talked about last week, and we'll, we'll bring that in and, and talk about sort of, again, we're agnostic on the tools, but uh, all the tools are great until they're not great. So in the right ratios, they make a lot of sense. Well, so I, I, as you do that real quick, because I think yeah. I know where you're going, it's to insurance. Yeah. I'm going to use that same car analogy again, right? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, not, not all policies are created equally, and there's quite a few on the marketplace that we, we don't like. So keep in mind that that has to factor in when you're looking at these strategies. Right. A Yugo is a car and a Bugatti is a car, but they're not quite the same car. Right. So if you're using Bugattis for this one, so one of the strategies that we use a lot of times or that, that, that's sometimes appropriate depending on the client is having that equal mix between that investment component and the insurance component. And last time we talked a lot about the insurance as, a, as a, uh, an alternative, as a way to create a market shock absorber. 
And it's, and it's really great at that because you have the non-correlation and, and you've got a number of kind of cool benefits. But at the end of the day, life insurance also comes with this thing called a death benefit, which is right. which is actually really useful. It, it sort of comes with it. It's, it's what I tell clients a lot of times is, I, I bought a Swiss Army knife and I needed it for the knife, but I found out later on that it had some tweezers built into the side of it. I didn't buy it for the tweezers, but it came with it. So one of the cool things you can do, and I'm going to paint a scenario, is we, we stroll into retirement. We've, we've segmented how we've saved, so we've got both. We've got investments. We've got insurance. And because I'm the guy talking right now, I can make up whatever numbers I want. So we walk into retirement, and husband and wife have got, have got both assets. I'm going to use the husband and I'm going to kill him off first because we always kill the guys off first, right? Well, I mean, life expectancy for a male is a little yeah. shorter because, yeah. you know. Well, guys do dumb stuff a lot of times that <laughs> women just don't do. So the husband's got a million dollars in his 401k, his IRA, his investment account. And in this example, he's got a million dollars in death benefit as well. So he's got equal, equal assets. So we stroll into retirement. We, we take the life insurance from the standpoint of the conversation and we, we put it on a shelf in the, in the back closet of a room that we never go into. We, we set We're it aside. We're done talking about it. We're done talking about it. We take that a million dollars and using Mary's sort of simulated pension from concept. From the investments? From the investments. So we take a okay. million dollars from our IRA and we roll it into the simulated pension. And the simulated pension company says, thank you, because they're, they're really nice like that. And what we do is we say, look, we're, we're going to get, we want maximum income out for the rest of our lives, right? And the way to go do that, and Mary talked about this idea of a joint annuity, which says that I'm going to get, or a joint pension, which says, I'm going to get money all of my life. And then when I run out of birthdays, it keeps going for my wife and, and as long as she's going to live. But in this scenario, we're going to do what's called a single life pension, which means as long as I'm on the planet, as long as the husband's on the planet, He's getting cash and he's getting a, a higher distribution rate because it's only on one life. Now, the trick with that is the moment he has his folding chair accident, right? The moment he graduates from the planet is a really horrible day for his wife, right? She's lost her best friend and her income. And I'm not sure what she cares about losing most at that point, but they're both gone all in the same day. Yeah, that's a bad day. It's, it's a horrible day. And we say, we're really sorry, but you remember that creepy closet in the back of the house with that little blue piece of paper? I need you to hand that over. And what we're going to go do is write you a check. The insurance company is going to spring into action at this point. And we're going to write you a check for a million dollars and completely refill the bucket that you just burned down. So and, if you need income, you can pull it from there. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's our running joke is you can either use it to create your own pension and last for your life. Maybe it's a signing bonus for a new husband, whatever you want to go do with that money. It is yours, but you've completely refilled your tank um, so that you can go, you can get a fresh start on that other end and you don't have any, you're not skipping a beat as far as income. Right. Well, what I think is really interesting, and I just want to clarify one thing, right? We just did this example and we used the husband as the person that uh, the income stream was based off of, but you right. could just as easily do this and reverse it. So the income stream is based off of the wife. And in situations right. where both parties are bringing a lot of assets to the table, we frequently do both. So it's just dependent on who, who owns which asset, right? So if I've right. got a 401k and Mike's got a 401k, we're both going to set these up. That way, no matter who passes away first, you have income continuation for both spouses. And then because we both have the life insurance in place, we've also guaranteed legacy regardless of who passes away first for right. the next generation. And so when I, when I really go through this, um, I find that this strategy is really good for people who have longevity for people who don't like market risk um, and for right. people who maybe have some discipline issues when it comes to spending. Um, because if it's, if they only spend what they get, they'll work within that. But if they know there's more, sometimes people like to creep over that line just a little bit, but right. you know, I think it's really key here too, to say that the type of annuity that you use to do this is a big determining factor on how successful this particular right. strategy is. And Absolutely. I think the funding of the insurance and the funding of the investments along the way is also incredibly important because there is an appropriate ratio. So we're, I'm going I'm to go back to the Goldilocks analogy here. Right, Do right, right. To hold just right. And understanding those ratios is key. So, um, you know, when you think about this particular strategy compared to the one we talked about last time, last time we talked about that market shock absorber. 
the most important thing in the market shock absorber strategy is access to cash. The death benefit right. is very secondary in that particular strategy. In this strategy, the access to the cash is nice because you've got liquidity, right? So you can put right. your hands on money if you need it. But the most important thing is that the amount of the death benefit is equal to whatever assets are going to go into that annuity. Because right. once it's in the annuity, you need to know that once that payout stops, that the assets are essentially, the insurance will refill that bucket. It becomes very important to do that. And right. so that's something that has to be measured from the time you start saving for a strategy like this. You have to reevaluate it every year. And I'm right. going to go so far as to say flexibility of funding is key here. And that is not something you typically get in insurance contracts, especially whole life. So the structure of those contracts becomes incredibly important. But again, right. this goes to balance, right? If you have ever used uh, a commercial grade super glue, right? And, right? and I keep using this and, you know, a, a lot of my female clients are like, what? <laughs> I've not done that. Even some of the guys are like, I've never used that before, but it comes in in two different tubes. There's resin right. and a hardening agent. What happens if you forget one of those tubes? Right. It's just a mess. It's just a mess, right? It's maybe sticky. But when you have the uh, appropriate balance or ratio between the two, there is a chemical re reaction that occurs between the two that creates a bond that can hold oftentimes up to 2,000 pounds. So it becomes very powerful. And it's the interaction of those tools that creates that power because when used separately, you're, you're leaving a lot of that on the table. And so when I think about these strategies that we've talked about last time and again this time, right. what's really the magic here is the combination of the tools because there is no one tool that is going to solve all of your problems. And it goes right, right. back to that analogy with the golf clubs. You've got to have a full set of golf clubs in your bag, but it's incredibly important to have an advisor that can help you figure out when it's appropriate to purchase and play each club in your bag. Right. Um, Eric, do you want to add anything to that? Anything else? Yeah. About the no, it reminds me of my favorite golf analogy or the golf story is drive for show and putt for dough, right? It's it's go. it's the driver that gets you there, but it's that that last few feet that really helps seal, make it all happen and, and make it all come together. And it's and it's in that right ratio, which is what you talked about. Um, and the other thing I think is really important, just as I as I think that, that we close this out. One of my favorite sort of concepts is um, learning from Dwight Eisenhower. He was the, uh, the general during World, World War II in the, the European theater. And he had a rule is that if he had to make a decision, the first question he always asked was, when do I have to make this decision? And he would wait until the last possible moment to make a decision because he was always getting new information. He was always getting new data, new input of what's going on. He would never make a decision until the last possible moment. And, and I think it's key, you know, we talked about that shock absorber, we talked about this sort of simulated pension. And it's not, and it's one of those things that you don't make a decision when you're 30, how you're going to make life work out when you're 70. Right, right. You want to make the decision about how you want to go make it all turn out at the last possible moment. But all along the way, you want to give yourself the most flexibility on how you design that. And it's and it's building options. that's the key. Right. And I think I think what you're saying there is so incredibly important, because if you just wait till retirement to try to set up some of these strategies, you don't have all the tools in your bag. So it's really important right. to take a look at where you are right now and figure out which action items need to happen today, funding the insurance, funding the investments, making sure you're in the right ratio so that you have these choices in the future. And I did think of one more thing while you were talking that I just want to make sure that we add in here. When we look at the market shock absorber and we look at the simulated pension as two, two of the strategies that we have talked about, right. those are really two very extreme strategies because the way we sure. explained them, it was 100% one way or 100% the other way. And the reality is when it comes to implementation, some people do, most people do a variant that includes right. both of them, right? right? And so they may look at the simulated pension as a way of making sure they've got enough money for their mortgage, their minimum lifestyle, their Medicare premiums, all of that type of thing. Right. And then they may leave the rest of the assets more in that market shock absorber type of situation so they can still take advantage of the potential for market upside. Um, right. But they know they've got at least their minimum lifestyle locked down. Some people look at it and they're like, you know what? I hate annuities. I don't care. They only want to do the market shock absorber. Right. And then other people look at it and say, I hate the market. I, I only want to do one. Right. But there's, there, 
when you look at the extremes, if it works all the way at the most extreme hot temperatures and right. all the way at the most extreme cold temperatures, all the variations that come in between, we know that that they're going to be able to handle those environments. Right. Yeah. It's it's the hybrid that is usually the is usually the solution. Right. It's somewhere in between. Right. And that goes back to our whole conversation about hybrid vigor. So if you <laughs> didn't right. catch that podcast, go back and listen to it. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, thank you guys for joining us yeah, today. Thank we you really so much. Appreciate you. We'll see you next time.